uh, or a minute past, so why don't we get going? Um, welcome everybody to the Monday, April 12th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Um, Deborah, could you please read the roll? Chairman Garvin? Here. Councilor Boucher? Here. Councilor Devereaux? Here. Councilor Gabrielson? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Noonan? Here. Mr. Chairman, you do have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, can we do the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any uh, correspondence or reports that they'd like to bring forward at this point? Go ahead, Councilor Noonan. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let you know, I got an email uh, from a Cape resident who happens to be my mother, which is why the rest of you didn't get it. <laughs> but she just wanted to pass along compliments to a couple of um, town staff. So Matt, I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, she said Teresa Olson and Janet Staples were hugely helpful to her taking care of a tax issue. And she just wanted to let me and uh, the rest of the council know that um, they were very expedient and friendly and helpful. So just wanted to pass that on. Thank you very much. I will make sure they they know in the morning. But yeah, we're, Great. we're grateful for, the, for their efforts and thank you for the compliment. And glad your mom got taken care of well. <laughs> uh, anybody else um, with anything to report? Okay. Um, We'll go on, move on to the finance committee report, turn it over to Councilor Gabrielson. Great, thanks, Jamie. Um, I'll, uh, I'll keep it brief. Um, the uh, financial statements continue to be tracking right along where we'd like to be seeing them um, in terms of um, both the revenues and expenses side. I think it looks like from the dashboard, we got within three grand of the SALT budget for this year. So that was pretty spot on budgeting or weather forecasting or something like that. Um, and um, I just wanted to mention, there's a couple of other items uh, related to financing on the agenda, including a uh, opportunity for public comment on the budget coming up later on. Uh, along, in addition to that, the council will also be holding our regular budget workshops on April 26th and 27th, which will offer opportunities for the budget. And uh, we're anticipating having some discussion around some of the larger ticket um, items, capital expenses that'll be coming up, not in this year's budget in out years, but having some of those conversations as part of the 27th um, workshop as well. Um, and I think that's it for finance committee report. Are there any questions for Jeremy? Okay. Um, at this point, we have the opportunity for any citizens who would like to comment uh, about something that is not on tonight's agenda. We have um, about 20, uh, I'm sorry, 14 folks joining us um, at this point. So if anybody that's um, uh, in the audience wants to speak about something that's not on the agenda, now is your opportunity to do so. Just raise your hand in the uh, Zoom meeting. Don't see any hands going up at this point. Um, so seeing none, we'll um, move on to uh, the manager's monthly report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I know you have a heavy agenda this evening, so I will be uh, fairly brief, but there are a couple of items that I, I'd like to update you on. Uh, one is that uh, after meeting uh, middle of last month and discussing the opportunity to have uh, or possibly have a Memorial Day celebration at the Village Green and the town center and a parade, uh, the committee has decided to uh, recommend not having it again this year and foregoing until next year. Uh, we will bring out our, our virtual uh, parade that we did, uh, or celebration that we had last year that was extremely well received and uh, grateful for the efforts that folks have there. It's a difficult decision, but uh, with uh, 
numbers being where they are at and have been trending for a while, it's been somewhat concerning and the ability to physically distance and uh, have folks uh, be safe and celebrate. Uh, we hope that they can celebrate with friends and family and remember uh, the service of those who have passed in, in protecting our country and our freedoms. Uh, but we are looking forward to a triumphant return in 2022 of the celebration uh, for sure. Uh, a quick uh, financial note is that uh, community services programming opened up uh, a, a week and a half ago or almost two weeks ago, and it had the single largest subscription event ever in the history of community services with $200,000 worth of revenue in one overnight. I think Kathy came in and thought that the uh, results were uh, that the math was off, but it was an amazing. So there is a huge amount of pent-up demand for some great programming. Uh, with some, with some, uh, you know, some COVID-safe senior programming and trips that are upcoming, and uh, uh, you know, we're seeing good, good things take place at community services, and uh, that's very optimistic, and we're happy to see that go forward. And then uh, uh, this, uh, this week there will also be a, a, pre, uh, a presentation of talking trash uh, through the Thomas Memorial Library with the Recycling Committee. Uh, they've got a good turnout so far for that, and if you're looking for uh, information on how to properly recycle and other areas of concern relating to refuse disposal, uh, please tune in. I think it's going to be worth your time. And uh, it beats uh, watching uh, reruns of uh, anything on Netflix these days. So original programming that it will help you make a difference. We are happy to provide it. So uh, that being said, uh, that's what I have for this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Are there any questions for Matt? <clears throat> I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, uh, Councillor uh, Noonan, Councillor Gabrielson and I uh, just um, about an hour ago joined um, Matt, um, town planner Maureen O'Meara, a few other folks from the community um, for the official flag raising at the uh, new yard arm flagpole on uh, the town green. So uh, thanks to the folks that um, came out for that very limited and COVID safe uh, gathering, but uh, it's great to have that officially dedicated and to see the flags flying. Um, they cleared out beautifully for us and it was a nice um, event. Um, it was recorded, so I think something's going to get put up on the town website if um, people want to check that out. Um, definitely want to um, thank uh, a couple of community members, um, Jim Hubner and Jeff Holden, Tom Egan, for their very generous donation uh, that made that flagpole possible. Uh, and recognize Dr. Jacobson, uh, who worked with the town to create the easement uh, on which the town green sits and, uh, and where that flagpole is located. So um, thank you to all of those that were involved in making that happen and being part of the um, uh, special uh, celebration earlier today. Um, the other thing I just wanted to take a minute um, was to um, sadly note the passing of a respected community member um, Sher Maltenberg, um, and uh, pass along um, mine and the council's condolences to school board chair Heather Altenberg and her family, um, as well as uh, Allie Altenberg and her family in town. Um, Sherm was a, a great caper and uh, involved in a lot of different things, most recently the land trust, and um, he, will, he will definitely be missed. So um, uh, it's with our heartfelt sympathies that we pass along our condolences uh, to, to his family. So um, with that, uh, we'll move on to our regular agenda. And um, uh, the next items, uh, the next item is the uh, review of the draft minutes of the March 8th meeting. Is there a motion on that item? I move that we adopt the minutes as written. Motion by Councillor Gabrielson, is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Penny Jordan, is there any discussion? Seeing none, Deb, could you call the roll for the vote, please? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. 
Thank you. Um, next up is item number nine, which is presented in the agenda as a consent agenda, uh, consent calendar for items number 62-2021 through 66-2021. Um, this includes uh, acceptance of an anonymous donation to the police department, acceptance of a grant award from the Bureau of Highway Safety, uh, the recommended policy relating to the short-term general fund and uh, school construction bond order uh, item and the school budget validation referendum warrant. Um, is there any counselor that would wish to pull out any of those agenda items from the consent calendar. Councillor Penny Jordan. I'd like to pull out the 64 and 65. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there, so we'll uh, handle 64 and 65 separately. Is there anyone uh, else on any of the others? Okay. Um, before I move on on those, is there anybody from the public then that would wish to speak about item 62-2021, 63-2021, or 66-2021? And one thing I'll just clarify on 66-2021, the school budget validation referendum election warrant, all of that is is simply to set the date and the wording on the election warrant. Um, which is a yay or nay, in favor or opposed to. Uh, there's nothing at this point um, that uh, pertains to the budget amount that's being set to um, uh, the referendum or anything like that. It, this is basically just to draw up the language for the ballot um, and to be in accordance with the statute for how far in advance that needs to be done. So um, still much to come, uh, as uh, Councilor Gabrielson alluded to earlier, uh, as far as um, the school board presenting the budget, uh, their budget to the town council in a couple of weeks, and um, further public hearing on those items. So, uh, so returning to my question as to whether or not there's any public comment on the three items that are staying in for the consent calendar, if you do want to speak on those, feel free to raise your hand. Seeing none, is there a motion on uh, the items in the consent calendar then? I'll move that we adopt, uh, I guess, so the motion would be a consent calendar, that we adopt a consent calendar consisting of items six, uh, 62, 63, and 66. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Make that motion. Great. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. I'll go with Councillor Noonan on that. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, can we call the roll for the vote, please, again, Deb? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, so remaining from that batch is 64 and 65, um, the two finance related ones. Um, I'm definitely going to open up for public comment on this and there's now 19 people, uh, members of the public. I think it might benefit um, the public comment though, if we hear from uh, the finance director first, um, John Corderaro, who's joining us, to um, uh, introduce and, and discuss the recommendation here. Uh, I think uh, also uh, Marcy Weeks from the um, school department is with us as well. I'm not sure if, um, if she was planning to contribute to that um, presentation as well. So um, why don't we start with that, just so I think uh, everybody, including members of the public, has a little bit better idea of what's being um, recommended here, and then we can turn it over to public comment and then um, council action. So, John, are you with us? I think you might be muted, John. And, John, I have you promoted. I'm here. 
Gotcha. Glad to okay. Clear. Sorry, I, ahead, I was muted. Uh, so item 64 is a policy relating to short-term general fund borrowing. Uh, the recommendation here <clears throat> is that when the town approves a bond order, that we take a look at whether or not we have cash reserves or cash uh, assets that we can use instead of borrowing short term under uh, the bond order. Uh, what I'm proposing is a written policy that says the town can do it. It needs to be uh, authorized by the town manager that because you use your cash to support a project, you forego interest earnings on it. Um, and therefore, uh, I uh, recommended setting an interest rate based on what we get from our overnight rate through our primary banker and adding 50 basis points. The savings here is that when you do a uh, temporary short-term borrowing against a bond order, uh, you issue bond anticipation notes. They can be issued through a capital market or through local banks. The cost of going through the capital markets is, uh, is compounded because you, you start with the bond order, so you have a cost for your bond counsel. Then you have the cost of issuance, you have your financial advisor, and you have credit ratings. So that becomes a costly matter, but it has a lower interest rate. Now, compared to <clears throat> issuing through a local bank, there are less costs uh, because you don't have to pay cost of issuance, you don't have to do uh, a credit rating, but they capture a higher interest rate. What I'm suggesting is that once we have a bond order in place, that we use our own cash, but that the project reimburse the general fund for foregone interest so that the taxpayers are not losing out on what would otherwise be interest earnings on the money that's available to the town. The second item, and number 65, is a request from the school board. Uh, it was a written request from the school chair and from the chair of their finance committee requesting that the town council authorize a $300,000 uh, bond. They would use those funds to pay for a concept design for the Pond Cove Middle School project. Uh, again, if we were to have that bond order in place, we could only uh, get proceeds available either through the issuance of the bond or through the issuance of a bond anticipation note. If the policy in number 64 were approved, we would be able to use the town's cash on a written agreement and reimburse the town for foregone interest that we would otherwise would be losing. Okay, thank you, John, for the introduction and overview. Um, I'll note that um, the school board chair, Heather Altenberg, um, reached out to me uh, uh, on this item that uh, they have a conflicting meeting tonight um, regarding one of uh, superintendent candidates um, that they're pursuing. Uh, otherwise, both she and um, the school board finance chair, Phil Saucier, would be here also to speak um, on, on this item. So I know, uh, I think I saw both uh, Superintendent Wolfram and Marcy um, among the public attendees. So um, with John's introduction out of the way, I'm gonna open this up for first for public comment. So if anybody from the public would like to speak on this item, uh, now is your opportunity, on either of these items, I guess, uh, now is your opportunity to do so. Um, so either on the policy itself um, that's being proposed um, for the self-funding option or on the request um, from um, the school board for the bond amount. Entertain public comment on either of those at this point. Don't see any hands going up at the moment. Um, 
so I guess I'll turn it over to the council then um, for um, proposed action and discussion. Go ahead, Councillor Penny Jordan. Um, I'm going to take uh, item 64 first. Um, I understand exactly how uh, John Q put this out there, and I understand uh, uh, the concept. I also understand the fact that it appears to be more cost effective to use the um, uh, general fund of uh, town dollars or um, <clears throat> the, my position is that this is this is a policy uh, a policy change or a new policy being introduced about how we manage general fund dollars and how we can leverage them in in different ways um, and so what I think about is the fact that um, using this type of approach and, um, and really implementing this type of policy uh, becomes a, um, almost like a, uh, I considered it a, a slippery slope because I don't see what is the criteria that will be applied when we uh, use uh, this type of uh, approach and this type of usage for general fund dollars. So what's the criteria? Uh, every policy I think should have some set of criteria. Um, and, and when we look at this, it can say that um, uh, if we want to apply this policy in the future, um, we can say, well, we did it before, so therefore. So what I'm asking is that if we're going to develop this type of policy, there are certain things I need to understand. One of them is the uh, criteria that will be applied in order to use this. Are there limits in which the town manager can um, just kind of do uh, an FYI, I use this loan approach. Is it always going to be uh, come to the council and we discuss this? Is it that um, we will have maturity dates associated with these types of loans? I don't see a maturity date on the one that's put forward right now. Um, and will we set it as a standard will be these loans will exist for one year or and they're renewable. So as I look at this and I look at this from a policy perspective, I think there are some elements that we as a council maybe need to discuss in more of a workshop setting. Thanks, Penny. Um, I Maybe John, you can clarify too. I, as I understand it, with the two separate items here, one is to consider the policy of being able to do this, but just approving the policy doesn't necessarily obligate us to the second item, which is whether or not to actually go through with the self-funding for this particular request. So um, obviously they're intertwined in this particular instance, but even if the, the latter had not been presented to us, the former might be an option we'd be considering regardless, I guess is the way I'm putting it. Does that make sense? If you're asking a, me, yes. Yeah, that was a question for you, John. Yeah. Yes, that is yeah. correct. Okay. Um, so I, I only raise that for clarification so that as folks are considering this, I think, I think you know, one is to consider the merit of the policy item. The other is then to also consider the merit of the request being made. But um, in any case, Councillor Devereaux, you are next. Go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Garvin. Uh, I have to agree with um, with Councillor Jordan on this. I think that we're sliding down a slippery slope when we give oversight, um, council oversight. We 
we're removing town council oversight, basically. Um, it says in here, town manager has delegated approval um, of such financing. So there's no maximum in here. There's no, um, as Penny pointed out, there's no criteria. So any town manager could uh, just decide to do that with no town council oversight whatsoever. Um, that's really um, scary to me. And I know we have great people and great people in place, but there's a reason that the town council has always had oversight over this. So um, I have a big concern ab about the criteria. There's no maximum limit. And um, my other question is to John, this, this sounds great that if you did a bond this way, it would save people money, but there's really no reason the town council couldn't approve it and you could still bond this way. Uh, oh, oh, you're, you're absolutely correct. So, so why are we taking away town council's oversight uh, when we could do this with town council approving, approving it? So um, without a um, workshop to discuss this, it, it feels like it's taking away um, basically the voters' rights to have town council review this and talk about it and decide on this. Um, I, I think we need we need a um, some sort of a workshop to review it. Thanks, Councilor Devereaux. Um, I have two things I just want to raise. The first being, um, without being um, explicitly stated in the suggested language um, that's before us, I assume that uh, the same million dollar threshold for any expense would apply to this. So, I mean, there is the effective cap of that, that any expense of any kind more than a million dollars um, actually has to has to go for referendum approval. So um, uh, there's that as a self limiting cap based on that policy separate from this one. Um, now, there's a lot of money between zero and a million. That we can obviously discuss whether or not the, the manager alone should have that authority to to um, authorize that kind of borrowing or not. But anyway, um, that does that technically is in place. The second thing I wanna raise before we go too much further, um, because a couple of counselors have brought it up around um, um, having further and deeper discussion on this. John, can you enlighten us on um, whether or not there's a specific time sensitivity to this or um, uh, need to specifically take action to move this forward? affirmatively or not tonight, or can, can you tell us a little uh, bit more on, about that? On item 64, there is there is no pressing need to act on it. I guess it, it relates more tonight. to item 65 for the request for what what the school board's looking to bond, so. I would, I would defer to uh, Marcy, the uh, okay. school business manager, I believe is on the call. Yep, Matt will get her joining us in a second here. Hi, Marcy. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Great. So uh, yes, I can clarify that. Um, we had gone through the process and we have the uh, the plan in place to start the community engagement process with the architects and engineers. It, it's not like it's pressing uh, tonight, but we would like to start moving forward of, um, with that process. But of course, um, it's not it's not time sensitive for this evening. Certainly, that's that would be okay. So, if um, if the council decided to move this to a workshop as a result of this discussion and then potentially bring it back around for our May meeting, while not optimal, it's not, uh, it's not uh, completely disruptive to the plans is what I'm hearing. Right, I, I think that it would be excellent in the perfect world, um, Councilor Garvin, if we <laughs> said yes, it'd be great for tonight, but um, 
it sounds like there's um, some discussion that would like to be taken place. So I understand that. And um, I can also uh, answer any other questions if you have some. Okay, I see a couple other counselor hands raised. So why don't you hang with us for a minute and then I'll go to Councilor Gabrielson. Great, thank you. Um, I, I, and I, for the record, I, I'd be in favor of separating these um, and and maybe moving forward with item 65, even if um, we need more discussion on 64. Um, I do think, I, I, I think the idea of putting this to a workshop is a good one. Um, in particular, I'd like to, you know, think about what the, the limits are. I, you know, I would note the other limit on this that's placed in it, the way that it's written is that it has to be for a, a bond issuance that the council has approved. So there is that additional limit on the authority as written, but um, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more on, on how those limits might apply with regard to say, uh, the amount of capital that's available within the general fund balance um, and, you know, as well as the, the terms of the, the loans um, that I believe Councillor Jordan raised as well. Um, so, it, Jamie, I don't believe we have a motion on the table at this point. Would it be appropriate for me to make a motion to table I, I, item 64 at this point, or do you want to hear finished discussion before we have a motion? Um, if you could just hold on that a second, if you're if you're intending to table it, um, I, I do. Since we've opened the the, the discussion, um, well, you know, technically slightly out of order, I, I do want to give other folks the, the chance to weigh in without um, sure. without cutting off the discussion. So, um, it, 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 were you done with your comments? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, yes. um, Councillor Noonan. I'll go to you next. Thank you. Um, I think that Councillor Gabrielson just hit most of what I was thinking, um, but I do just want to reiterate, I would advocate for separating 64 and 65. I think for 65, if we did uh, want to consider it, we would just have to change the wording of the motion where it says um, uh, to issue bond anticipation notes or use a self-funded interfund loan. So if we don't approve that tonight, we could still approve 65 and we just have to take that option for the interfund loan out. I think is what is the way I'm seeing it. So yes, I would I would advocate. Um, I agree, maybe tabling 64 and then considering 65 still tonight. So okay. thank you. Um, thanks, Councilor Noonan. I um, I want to just ask because um, I see her hand raised. Um, Superintendent Wolfram, I want to bring her into just to see if there was something else um, that you wanted to add to the discussion, Donna, before we move on. So All go right. ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. So uh, in talking about this time sensitive issue, um, tomorrow night, uh, the board is approving their budget and we have the 300,000 um, in our budget. Um, and uh, in order to keep the budget down, we removed it um, when we heard about the possibility of going to a bond, either through the town or through um, uh, a bank or the bond, the bond bank. So, um, so in thinking about whether it's time sensitive, it sort of is time sensitive because we would have yep. to put 300,000 back in our budget. So I just wanted yeah, to- Yeah, I, I think, I appreciate the clarification. I, I think what I'm hearing is the, the concern about moving too quickly on the change in policy, not necessarily the, the, the borrowed amount okay. item, number Good. 65, and then uh, it, it sounds like there'd be a chance to rejoin those two together. I, I, I don't know if, if, if we take action on number 65 tonight, I don't know if the intent was to immediately, um, you know, approach, um, you know, the different other um, uh, markets that, that John identified, you know, in his, in his presentation, or if, if, if there's time to wait on the, question on the self-funding, but um, in any case, I, I think what I'm hearing is, is let's talk through the policy question a little bit more, but maybe take action on the other part of the discussion. So, Great, thank but you. thank you for, yeah, thank you for clarifying that, Donna. Um, so did any other counselors want to have anything on this before we, sounds like offer a motion to refer, um, rather than table it, uh, a motion to refer this to a workshop, I think would be the appropriate action. 
number 64-2021. I'll make the motion. Um, move. I move that oh. I move that we move item six four dash two zero two one uh, to a uh, workshop. And can I add that and prepare it so it can be uh, uh, reviewed at our uh, May council meeting? Yep. That sounds good. Yep. Um, we can we can work out the details of the workshop date, uh, mm -hmm. whether because um, we've got our, our budget meetings coming up, but maybe we tack it on to the back half of the second meeting that we were still going to hold to talk about capital stuff. So we might be able to piggyback some of those things. But motion on the table is to refer to workshop, bring it back around for main uh, meeting. Is there a second? A second. Seconded by Councillor Noonan. Is there any additional discussion? Can we uh, ask that John Q prepare the criteria for us to review at our workshop? Sure, what absolutely. We, yeah, what sure, would the look like? Okay, good. I will take into account uh, the comments that were raised tonight and rework it. Cool, thank you. Okay, uh, any other discussion? All right, seeing none, I'll call the question on the motion to refer to a workshop, item number 64-2021. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so for 65-2021, um, the question is, and uh, so the, the, the question on this would be whether or not to approve the, the, and authorize the bond order request. And the, the wording in the agenda here is that that can be fulfilled through multiple different mechanisms, depending on, on how things go on the previous item. So um, is there a motion on this? Councillor Gabrielson. Uh, I'll make the motion to start discussion, sure. Um, I, I move that we, um, do you, I, I guess th there's just one clause that needs to be struck from the draft motion, I think. Do you want me to read the, the motion as it would be amended? Uh, sure that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council authorizes a bond in the amount of $300,000 for funds to be utilized to pay for the development of a concept design for the construction of the Pond Cove Middle School as prepared by the town's bond council. The bond order will allow the town to issue bond anticipation notes, period. The amount borrowed would be repaid by either the issuance of a bond authorized by the order or a larger bond that would be authorized by referendum. The school department through the school budget would be responsible for repaying the general fund. I'm sorry, would be responsible for repaying the ban debt holder. Um, so before I look for a second, I guess uh, is, should, the, should the wording uh, where you were uh, eliminating the language that's in the draft motion, should that instead be, um, should that somehow allude to the availability of the self-funded um, mechanism if that, if that is available? I, I, I want to make sure that we're not um, taking action on something that potentially cuts out that option if that ultimately winds up being what makes sense to go with. So I'd, I'd rather keep it open-ended to the degree that if, if that mechanism is in place, then it is an option to use. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it makes sense to me. Um, just trying to see how that, that might be worded. <laughs> yeah. 
is it possible, sorry. Please. I have a suggestion. Go ahead, Councilor Noonan. Yep. Is it, possible, <laughs> is it possible to strike the entirety of the second se the second sentence, the bond order will allow the town to issue? Do, do we need that level of detail? Can we strike the second sentence and then make the last sentence, the school department through the school budget would be responsible for repaying the debt holder, whether that be a bank or the town itself or? I would I accept that as a friendly amendment. John or Matt, do you have an opinion on that? I, I think that's fine. I, I would agree. I think that, that it still allows you the flexibility uh, to do what you, you know, have both options available to you. And that's, uh, that doesn't take away from the heart of the, uh, of the approval. OK. Um, so Jeremy, would you mind just reiterating Sure. Um, the motion, it, it, it just basically want to recap what Gretchen said, strike the sen second sentence and the language change in the final sentence. Sure. So it would now read the Cape Elizabeth Council authorizes a bond order in the amount of $300,000 for funds to be utilized to pay for the development of a concept design for the construction of the Pond Cove Middle School as prepared by the town's bond council. The amount borrowed would be repaid by either the issuance of of a bond order or a larger bond that would be authorized by referendum. Um, the school department through the school budget would be responsible for paying the debt holder. Thank you. Uh, is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Noonan. Is there discussion from the council? Councillor Penny Jordan. Um. I just want to go on record as uh, opposing this at this point in time. Um, I have a couple of questions and maybe uh, Donna or Marcia could answer them. Um, so when I, when I read this memo from uh, Heather and, um, and Philip uh, regarding the request for the 300,000, it says concept design for new construction of Pond Cove and Middle School. If uh, we go through, we spend the $300,000 to come up with a concept design for a, a new construction of these two schools. And it goes to the voters, to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, and it gets voted down. What is the uh, what is the scenario at that point in time to go back to the uh, uh, to the drawing board and see if a renovation is the approach or to what's the discussion then if this gets voted down? Either Don or Marcy, do you want to answer that? Sure, and. Um... Donna, you can interrupt me at any point if you like. Um, I think at this point, um, Councillor Jordan, that the the risk would be that, as you said, that there's a potential that we do the process and we go to a referendum and it doesn't get passed. And at that point in time, um, from what I've observed and been advised, there's a regrouping. And then at that time, there is more community engagement to see if, um, the, can go back out to, again for another effort to go back out to referendum with a different process. So the, we're trying to keep the risk low at this time and put um, a full effort into what the community's needs are with the concept design in this next year and put full effort with, with high hopes for the referendum, but um, it's at the voters will. And at that time, it definitely, the obligation is clearly stated that we would budget and pay back the, either the bank or the town at that point in full budgeted and then regroup and, and try again. Um, if, if that were the worst, the worst case scenario, if it was voted down, yes. So again, trying to keep the risk as low as possible at this point. So, um, sorry, Jamie, can I continue? Yeah, go ahead. My guy? Then I'll go to Jeremy. Um, okay. So, um, so if it were voted down and you, um, the 300,000 is old, that 
then um, a year from now, you'd be in a position to pay back that uh, 300,000 or have to um, uh, fund it in some way in order to pay it over time. At that time, um, what I would probably be doing is looking at our budget with our cash balance, our fund balance reserve to see if we can include it in the budget in entirety. Um, or if we have worked out, if we're uh, doing the financing through the bank or, um, or even through the town, if there were payments involved, we would definitely be budgeting the payments. But we would be, my job right now is to make sure that uh, we have the cash reserve moving forward to be able to pay that back in full if the bond is defeated and then we have to do something differently. So yes, that, that would be the plan at that point, Councillor Jordan. So can the dollars be financed? What, what was that? I'm sorry, what was that? So can the dollars be financed? I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, the concept design finance, is that what you were saying? Yeah, if it, it doesn't, if the referendum doesn't pass, can that three hundred thousand dollars really be financed? It would, um, if essentially, if we are borrowing for a year um, right now, it, that would be the financing for just the year with interest only, and then the intent would be that it is then um, paid either in full or within the year. From uh, and John, you can correct me on that, but. That's, that's essentially uh, with a bond anticipated note um, that a short-term financing is just what that would be. So, so yes, um, it would be mm -hmm. where we would have to make sure that our finances are in place. And so that's what I'll be working on um, as the next step to try to secure the budget for the school board to make sure that they're in that position if that is the case that we're facing in a year. Mm -hmm. Annie, uh, this is John. Uh, your question was uh, whether or not the 300,000, if the referendum were voted down, whether the 300,000 could be financed. It could be financed based on this bond order that is before you. It could be financed for a short period of time or for uh, several years to reduce the, uh, the principal that's paid out. Uh, but that's why the policy that was proposed in 64 is dependent upon having a bond order approved by the council and in place before uh, doing any additional financing. That answer your questions, Penny, for now? For now, yep. Okay. Um, Jeremy, you are next, go ahead. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to speak to the question Penny was raising uh, briefly too. I had the opportunity to talk with um, with Phil um, Saucier yesterday about this a little bit. And essentially, uh, you know, this is the the cost of this concept design is a an expense that the school board has decided that they're you know need to move forward with in order to put this project forward. Really, what this item is looking at is just it's really a cash flow um, item to take advantage of the low cost of borrowing right now. So instead of programming this full $600,000 for this year's school budget, you're spreading the cost of that expense over a couple of years. Um, and since the interest rates are so low right now, we can basically do that with very little, you know, cost in terms of money, in terms of borrowing. If the referendum is successful, then all of that cost can be capitalized as part of the larger bond, which is what that that sentence refers to um, by the bond, you know, rep, a bond that would be authorized by referendum for the larger construction bond. If not, then it's a short term borrowing take take advantage of those low interest rates and it gets repaid potentially even before the bond or the referendum comes through, depending on the timing for when that referendum happens. So. Um, that's my, that's my understanding from speaking with Phil anyway. And Jeremy, I just want to correct you. I think, you, I think you misspoke in stating the amount. I, I think I heard you say 600,000, it's 300. Sorry. I, I yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, um, before I go to next Councillor Boucher and then Councillor Devereaux, um, 
Marcy, am I accurate? I, I also spoke to Phil about this and I understand even though we're a week and a half or so out from meeting with the school board to review the budget in detail that um, while the amount to be borrowed has been taken out of the operating budget, am I correct that there's been a, an earmarked amount to cover the debt service? Yes, that's that correct. is in the budget. Okay. Yes. Um, Councillor Boucher, you were next. Yeah, I just wanted to add that from being on um, the subcommittee for the buildings, this step is being taken in order to get an accurate assessment of costs in order to ask for that larger bond. And so if this step isn't done, the amount that would go to referendum wouldn't necessarily be accurate. And so it is kind of um, just trying to get an accurate assessment of things at a low risk, like uh, Councilor Gabrielson said about the low interest rates. Councilor Devereaux? Um, th that's very, very true. However, um, this really needs to be part of our budget discussion. What happens if this, the big bond however big it is, um, doesn't pass for um, building two new schools, then we're basically kicking this off to another council to have to deal with. We're kicking it off to um, another budgeting process when really it's, it's, it, it should be dealt with now, we should talk about it now, and um, it should be in, in the budget rather than kicking it down the road to another council. So I, um, I have some concerns with putting it in a, in a bond that there's been no um, community engagement at all. We don't even know if our town is going to pass the big bond. So to bond this when there's been no community engagement, nothing's happened to gauge the pulse of the community of whether they want to build two new schools. Uh, I think we're putting the cart before the horse here. Um, Councilor Devereaux, I'm not sure I'm understanding your point about potentially pushing this off or kicking it to somebody else's plate to, to handle. Because I think what I just heard is that, um, I mean, this is sort of a classic chicken and egg situation, right? You can't scope the project and know what that big amount is that's gonna be borrowed or, or requested to be borrowed without doing the detailed work. You can't ask the people, the citizens of the town, are you in favor of buying this thing when they don't know what it is they're buying? So some work needs to be done to, you know, scheme up what, what, that, what that widget is that they're actually approving or not. Um, and everything I've heard so far is that if, if ultimately the citizens decide, no, we don't want that, it's on the school uh, board to repay that regardless of the financing mechanism, um, you know, to, to pay that back. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we get to uh, the determination that you were just laying out about public sentiment and things like that without doing this as a next step to begin with, I guess is my question. Well, what I'm saying is that because there's been no engagement, we have no idea um, what the public feels about building two new schools. We have no idea. And um, so- But if you went to them today, if you went to them today and asked them for their opinion on that, what would you use to present to them uh, any kind of proposal when that, that's what this is asking for? Well, we were, and you were in those meetings also, we were presented mm -hmm. with um, ranges. Um, they could have presented ranges to people and said, these are the ranges, um, whether it's renovation or it's building new schools, these are the ranges. But what I'm saying is that we, we don't even know if it's a 50-50 chance or a 90% chance that it's going to pass. So if it doesn't pass, uh, then this money is going to be pushed off into another budget. It won't, and typically when this has been done, it's put in the budget, it's budgeted, it's approved, 
and it's taken care of. We're sort of pushing it off to another council. If, if the big bond passes, great, it's all rolled in together. But if it doesn't, then this whole budget, this 300,000 is pushed off to another school board, another town council to work through um, the budget discussion. Uh, why not just take care of it? Um, especially since we, we don't know what the community um, is even thinking with regard to whether they they would agree to bond this or not. Um, Council Gabrielson, go ahead. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Um, um, with due respect, um, Councilor Devereaux, I, th th I think this has been part of the public discussion. It's been part of the school board's budgeting process, and it's also been part of the the, the committee that you you were. A member of looking at, at the options for the school um, renovation or, or construction, um, the school department or the school board committee has has made a policy decision to to fund this study. They're really just coming for us to ask us to authorize them to finance it in a way that um, is cost effective, in my opinion, um, and um, is going to help with essentially what's a cash flow problem um, for them this year due to, due to COVID related expenses. They can either absorb the entire cost of this in this year's budget, which will result in a tax increase, a larger tax increase year on year, or we can finance it and spread it over a couple of years, which will allow them to reduce the amount of tax increase that we see in this year. I mean, that's really the, the decision that's in front of us whether or not to proceed with the study, that, that's a decision for the school board to make. Um, the, the reason we're in this position is because the town has the municipal bonding authority for the school district as well as the town. And so that's why we're being asked to authorize the bond. They, they don't have the legal authority to, to issue a bond on their own. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, uh, Superintendent Wolfram had her hand up. I wanted to give her a chance to um, maybe respond to a couple of the comments that have been made. Go ahead, Donna. I just wanted to say that part of the work that this would cover would be the meetings with the town, um, meetings with the staff, gathering of information um, in um, what would be included in the schools. So that work hasn't started and can't start um, until uh, this $300,000 is secured uh, for the work. So thank you. So what you're saying is that part of it is the public process? Correct. Um, other discussion? Councillor Penny Jordan. Um, basically what I see um, happening here is a, uh, a project that's working under a set of assumptions. Um, and I've managed enough large projects in my lifetime to know that um, multi-million dollar projects, uh, once they leave the station, um, many times uh, head down the track and through pure momentum, they keep going. Um, this assumption is that uh, a, that new schools will be built. And I recognize citizens have not weighed in on it yet, but the assumption is the design we're doing is for new schools. Um, and so when we get to the point where, and I'm gonna say this again, that the new school referendum is voted down, we'll be asking for another set of dollars in order to say, okay, what design can the town accept? Um, and I'm, I'm kind of with Valerie in that we got to understand, I, I believe, understand what the appetite is for 
citizens of the town for funding um, an $87 million project or more. Um, and I believe, and Donna, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that Heather actually said, should we put something on the, um, the, the, the ballot when we do the school um, budget, yes or no, that kind of measures the pulp somehow. Um, and so I will throw that out again as I really would like to know what um, the appetite is in our town for um, new schools and um, multi-million dollar projects that we'll be paying for for 30 years. So that's, oops. Uh, Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Well, isn't that our next vote or did we just approve that? Sorry, in the, in the consent calendar, I can't remember. We did, didn't we? The, the referendum, we just approved the, the, the referendum vote, didn't we? Yes, yes, you did, Councilor Jordan. <laughs> so I thought, so I was gonna say, maybe we should have thought of that half an hour ago, Penny, and we could have changed it, or can we still change it to, to add that on? I mean, Anybody that like... voted affirmatively could make a motion to reconsider that item. Right, so maybe so, that's what we, we all, do. And we since can... we all voted affirmatively, we could do that, but. Um, I'm just saying it's not too late to, to try and do that. Other comments? Um, something I wanted to, I, I um, respect where both Penny and, and Council Devereaux are coming from. Um, I, I do um, disagree to a certain extent with the, the notion that there hasn't been um, a public process, an opportunity for public input um, in regards to these plans that have been being developed over time. Um, the committee uh, that was formed um, that worked on making the recommendation to the school board um, was a large committee that I think rep represented a very um, uh, diverse cross-section of the community. Um, those meetings were open to the public, received a significant amount of public input. Um, uh, and uh, like I said earlier, I, I, I think I, I, this is the next step in a process. Um, it would, I, I'm not sure another way forward on, um, aside from the financing structure of it, I, 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 what I'm hearing from some folks is whether or not it even makes sense to spend the money at all. So I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to separate those two things because some of the input from, from people during this discussion is why are we spending $300,000 potentially if we don't know um, what the community's appetite is for the big ticket? And then the other part of the discussion is just whether or not that should be financed through a bond mechanism of some kind or whether or not the school board should have included it in their operating budget. So I think those are two separate things. And I think on the, the latter one, we have um, more, uh, um, that falls more under our purview. On the former, I'm not sure it really does. So I'm just trying to distinguish between those things. Council Devereaux. Uh, thank you. Uh, I. I was not saying that there has not been a, um, a committee. We had a committee to look at this, the school and determine if it needed to be renovated, if it needed new, new schools built. We had a committee. I'm not saying there wasn't. What I'm saying is there hasn't been a full community engagement. There's a lot of people in town that don't even know that this is um, an issue that, that we're even considering um, raising their taxes um, in this amount. So I'm saying that because I feel that there's been no community engagement, we can't, um, 
we can't gauge whether it's a 50% chance, a 90% chance, a 10% chance of the bond passing. If the bond doesn't pass, then it's rolled off into another year's school budget. Last year, the budget increased four and a half percent. This year, I know that they've been, they were looking at seven and a half and they've been working on it and getting it down. But next year, it may be four and a half or seven and a half again. And now you're gonna roll that 300 into next year or the year after is what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is really, I think we need to look at it and decide if that 300 goes into the budget now, or is it reasonable to just keep rolling it off to another council um, to determine if the budget's too big, too small, because then it, 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 like it is now, it's in the budget. You're not gonna be able to just keep rolling it off. So that's my concern. So I, I think, and I'm not sure if I need to state it a different way. I, think, I still think, Councilor Devereaux, you're blending two separate and distinct questions because you started off your comments about um, not being sure whether there's community appetite for the big project. The second question is whether or not um, if the school board feels that this is something that needs to be done now, that they should either include it in their operating budget and figure out what the impact of that is, either in the form of increased impact to tax rate or having to you know, reduce or eliminate something else as a trade-off. But the school board is the one to make the decision about whether or not this is something that they think is an expense that they wanna move forward with. And, and then the second question just becomes, how are you actually paying for that? So to me, I, I think the entire question of, of you know, what the community appetite is for the large ticket item, really, I'm not sure is, is something for us to even be considering right now. I, I hear what you're saying. However, you, um, um, maybe I'm not saying it clear enough because they haven't looked at community engagement and we don't know how many people are for it or not. We don't, if we knew that the bond was gonna pass, then it'd be real easy to say, yes, let's do this and let's just roll it into the bond because it's going to pass. But what I'm saying is because we don't know and we haven't really done the community, to, we haven't gauged the, um, the town's desire for this. Um, we don't know whether we have a 50% chance of the bond passing or not. So my guess is it's not going to pass and then this budget item is going to be stuck in next year's budget of the year after. That's that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to say that um, that they shouldn't do it. Yeah. My point is it. just that we don't we don't take that position with any other item in a school budget where we don't we don't say oh well we're not sure what the community's appetite for a new you know, math teacher is, so we don't know if that should be in there or not, or, or, you know, and I'm giving a ridiculous example, obviously, but my point is the school building committee made a recommendation to the school board. The school board accepted that recommendation. Now the school board is coming to us with two options on how to pay for it. And, and that's, I think, what's before us, not the policy or, or political decision about whether or not the, the community wants the new schools or not. I, I agree, and you can continue to argue with me. However, um, I completely agree with you. However, they've never come to us before and said, we want to bond this money. It's always been put in the budget, always. And that's, so- That's fair, and that's what I just said. If, if we wanna debate that, that's fine, but I'm trying to steer us away from the conversation about whether or not, I'm, I'm seeing from some comments seepage of the issue of whether or not the school should be rebuilt or renovated. And that's not our decision to make right now, is all I'm trying to point out. I don't think anyone's making that argument right now. Um, what we're looking at is the budget and um, it's up to us to review budgets. So, um, and it's us, up to us to decide if we're going to bond this or not. Um, I think that's what's on the table. And that's what I'm trying to keep us focused on, so. Other discussion? Did 
Did you have another comment, Valerie, or your hand just still up? If there's no other discussion, then I guess we'll call the question on the motion. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? No. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? No. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries five yeas, two nays. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna and Marcy, for joining the discussion, and John for your uh, work on uh, on both of these items. Um, next up is item number fifty four dash two zero two one. This was an item that was tabled um, from our uh, March eighth meeting. Um, with apologies from the council at the time um, for um, having run long on our previous uh, agenda during that night. So I'm pleased to have um, uh, this item come back for us to uh, look at tonight. And I know we've got some folks from the um, uh, Ad Hoc Civil Rights Committee that are in attendance. So Matt, do you wanna promote any of those people that need to be? I'd be happy to Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, tonight, I believe we have in attendance uh, both co-chairs, Keila Austin Griffin and Melanie Thomas, and uh, and and Rachel Davis is the staff uh, liaison for that uh, for that committee. And we have all other members as well who are in attendance. So I will promote uh, Keila and Melanie here. If uh, take, taking just a moment, and there we go. They should both be joining us. Here we are. Good evening. Hi everybody. Thanks for joining us. And again, thanks for your patience last month. Appreciate it. And tonight for that matter, <laughs> as it's already quarter after eight. Having us. Um, so uh, I will um, open up for public comment, but I, I think like some of the other items that we've done, um, maybe go through um, the presentation that you've prepared as a starting point and then um, invite any public comment um, so that folks are sort of grounded in a little bit of, of what's uh, on the table here. Does that sound good? Sound, sounds great. Um, great. Matt, did you uh, promote Rachel as well? She's going to be doing our slide presentation. You're too kind, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> and uh, and I'll, Rachel, I'll have you uh, also as a, uh, make you as a co-host so you can Share her screen. Yes, exactly. Thanks, Melanie. Okay. Here we go. Oh, uh, let's Good to see. go. Okay. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, hello, my name is Melanie Thomas, and I co chair on this fabulous ad hoc committee known as the Civil Rights Committee. Keila Austin Griffin co-chairs with me and we will both do the presentation tonight that represents our entire team. We had our very first meeting via Zoom in September, 2020. Primarily, we have been meeting every other Wednesday for the past six months. Right now, the Civil Rights Committee is not permanent but we unanimous, unanimously believe it should be. We've had many discussions on what the work of this standing committee should look like. We've created a draft charge and more for your consideration. This is our presentation to you. Before we discuss the purpose that was originally given to us, we must first go back and understand what led to us getting this ad hoc committee started in the first place. Many of us remember in May of 2020, watching video footage of an unarmed African-American man named George Floyd being killed by police. Millions watched and were outraged. 
Here in Cape Elizabeth, this led our community to a unity rally and a Black Lives Matter peaceful protest during the summer of 2020. This community action led our town council to create this ad hoc committee and we thank them. This is the purpose and the charge you gave us in July of 2020. Our purpose, the committee shall be an ad hoc committee which shall identify and review policies in town government services and municipal departments that contribute to systemic and structural racism, making recommendations for policies to promote greater equity and inclusion. Next slide, please. Our charge. The Civil Rights Committee is specifically charged with the following. One, to prepare within three months from the first meeting of the Civil Rights Committee, a draft standing committee charge for town council consideration. Two, assess immediate actions and advise the town council on issues of racism and inequality in Cape Elizabeth. Next slide, please. The work we've done so far. Um, our committee began by developing a framework for assessing town policies for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Also, brainstorming possible engagement and educational opportunities for the community. And lastly, drafting a charge for a proposed standing committee. We have worked so hard during these last six months. Our next few slides will discuss each one of these bullet points in detail. Um, our framework for assessing town of Cape Elizabeth policies for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Number one, we worked on determining department and policies to evaluate which ones we were going to evaluate. Number two, determine purpose of policy and impact on our community. Number three, provide recommendations slash changes to policies if needed. Number four was to draft recommendations and report this to the committee. And number five was to report completed information to our town council. Our framework is like a, bull, a blueprint. We will be using the SWOT analysis. SWOT, S-W-O-T, stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We will use this same framework slash blueprint on each town department policy to be reviewed. This is what we will be looking at. The equity areas that a policy primarily impacts such as housing, employment, and opportunities within the community. Two, any unintended or potentially unintended, unintended consequences of that policy. And lastly, any harm that has been or could be caused by the policy. Next slide, please. Definitions. This framework includes a set of working definitions for concepts and terminology in order to create common understanding and consistency. These terms include, but are not um, limited to, diversity, equity, inclusion, equality, anti-racism, discrimination, structural racism, institutional racism, and systemic racism. Engagement and educational opportunities for the community. We have identified the following opportunities we would like to pursue. pursue. Um, we'd like to um, get permission to do a 21 day anti-racism challenge, um, partner with a sister city or a neighboring city, and of course, reach out to our community more by having conversations, surveys, and su such and such. Um, this is my absolute, favorite slide and hopefully the most, this is what I'm passionate about. Um, it is so important to get our community involved. We are making a proposal for you to approve us doing a 21 anti-racism challenge, which is a great way to get the community learning and processing at the same time. Also, Sister City, which is another great way to partner with another local town or out of state city or First Nations community um, where both communities can learn and share. 
also ongoing educational events for the community, um, like a town survey, would be so valuable. Um, Keila will now do the rest of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So our preliminary meetings also included exploring critical questions that could influence our work in an effort to anchor those ideas to the committee's stated purpose and charge. Our work in exploring these critical questions has led us to the following. We propose that the ad hoc Cape Elizabeth Civil Rights Committee become a permanent committee called the Cape Elizabeth Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee to serve as a bridge between the town council and the community in order to celebrate and advocate diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI. The committee shall promote education and training, increase community engagement, and review town policies and provide policy recommendations. We believe this new name embodies our scope of work and also allows this committee to represent and advocate for multiple social identities, putting diversity at the starting foundation, because unless we acknowledge diversity, both as something to be celebrated and as an area for advancement, we are unable to even begin to address equity and inclusion. Diversity includes all the ways in which people differ, encompassing the characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. Diversity brings together ideas from people of varying backgrounds and experiences in order to grasp a fuller, broader range of thoughts, feelings, interactions among community members. Diversity means representation. Equity is the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have presented, that have prevented a full participation of some groups. It is when everyone has access to the opportunities necessary to satisfy their essential needs, advance their well being, and achieve their full potential. Equity does not mean everyone receives the same, but rather everyone has the same access to shared resources. So equity means access. Inclusion is the act of creating environments in which any individual group can be and feel welcomed, respected, supported, and valued to fully participate. An inclusive and welcoming climate embraces differences and offers respect. In other words, and, and words and actions for all people. It means everyone can participate and everyone belongs. Inclusion recognizes our universal similarities and interdependence despite our differences. Inclusion means belonging. So with that in mind, we believe this committee will be able to achieve these goals by being tasked with the following duties. Number one, advise the town council on policies and practices to promote DEI. In line with our original charge, we will accomplish this by doing the following, reviewing policies and practices of town departments and make recommendations to promote anti-racism, equity and inclusion and advocate for DEI with respect to housing, transportation, public accommodation, and access to town services. The second component is education. Positive change begins with education and that learning is continuous. We will accomplish this by doing the following, developing programs, events, and initiatives to promote diversity, inclusion, awareness, and anti-racism in our community, and to provide ongoing guidance on approaches for training town officials and employees in order to eliminate explicit and implicit bias. The third way is through community awareness and engagement in hopes of creating shared ownership and providing opportunities to come together as a community to learn and grow together. We will accomplish this by the following. Create tools such as surveys in order to better understand our community's views and concerns about DEI and create campaigns that promote Cape Elizabeth as a town that is a welcoming and respectful place to live, work, and visit. And before we conclude, Melanie and I would like to say a special thank you to the fellow members of this committee for the time and effort behind the work we were able to present this evening. And members of town council, Valerie in particular, who has spent many hours helping to guide this process. Thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, thank you very much, um, Keila and Melanie and Rachel as well and Councilor Devereaux. Um, I'm going to, to keep us on process here, go back and ask if there's anybody um, from the public that would like to offer any comment on this item. 
before we go on. If you are interested to speak on this item, just raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. Okay. Uh, I'll turn it over to the council. Councillor Penny Jordan. Um, first of all, I want to thank the committee for uh, the great work. I, um, I think it hit um, all of the elements that I was seeking when we created this uh, ad hoc uh, committee. And I uh, appreciate all of the work that they've done. I don't know how the rest of you uh, want to proceed, but I, I will say that I think that this needs to be a, a standing committee in our town. Um, I, I think that it can um, serve many great purposes around education and bridges with the council, et cetera. So I don't know if we need to workshop this, but I, I would propose that this become a standing committee. And if you want that motion, I'm more than willing to make it. Thanks, Councilor Jordan. Um, I think, and Matt, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, um, if, if we want to do that, the, pro the best action would probably be to refer it to the ordinance, ordinance. committee to draft the formal charge. Is that correct? Right on, right yeah. on so that, Monday, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, rather, rather than a workshop, I, I'd suggest that we do that, have the ordinance committee draft, um, draft up the formal charge and bring that back and, and potentially have a workshop on that if we need to. But um, uh, so if you want to make that motion, Penny, uh, referring it to I think you articulated it very well. Your calendar. <laughs> I, <laughs> we needed an ordinance committee meeting. There um, you go. Yes, yes. Um, you're you're, you're, you're going to be you're going to be freed up in about a half hour, I think, from I all know. other obligation, right? <laughs> um, I move that uh, we uh, forward this along to the ordinance committee to draw up the formal charge, etc. Um, and I. Uh, put that in motion to make it a standing committee. I second the that. Motion by Councilor Penny Jordan, seconded by Councilor Devereaux. Uh, would other councilors like to weigh in with any discussion? I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, Councilor Boucher. Councilor Noonan. Yep, I just, yes, I echo that, but I also just wanna say, I think you really nailed the scope. Um, I'm really impressed with, you know, how well defined it is. And I think it sounds like a, a really great um, opportunity for the town. So we appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing what the ordinance committee can come up with. Councilor Devereaux? I'd just like to say um, thank you both so much and everyone on the committee. It's been such a pleasure and honor to work with everybody. Everyone's worked so hard. They meet every other week and um, put so much effort and energy into this. It's, it's um, such an honor to, um, to work with everybody. So thank you and keep up the good work. Any other comments? Uh, Matt, go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to echo. Uh, the comments as well. I know uh, Melanie and I had a number of conversations and uh, uh, really have enjoyed uh, speaking with her on multiple occasions. And uh, it's been a learning process for all because we have a lot of folks who are, are new to committee committee work and to town work. And uh, I really am so overjoyed to see this report tonight, as well as uh, the, having the wait over uh, to hear <laughs> to hear the report out. Uh, the other thought I was I was wondering on, and uh, just a question for Miss Thomas, and it would be uh, about the 21 day challenge. I know that that is uh, an, an effort that they'd like to see underway, and I didn't know if that was time dependent uh, or not, and what what direction you needed on, on that as well. Um, Could you also, oh, go ahead. Can, can, well, I was just going to ask because I had to say I was just wondering if you could maybe give us a little bit more detail on what that and what that is, what the concept is there. Sure, so um, I had, um, someone had reached out to me in Freeport. They have a tri-county um, 
coalition that they're doing. Uh, so they were the first ones to even have thoughts of doing a 21 anti-racism challenge where they felt like 21 days of learning something new is about enough to really get you understanding and processing. And, um, and, and I agreed. So I had I have been helping them with their 21 day challenge, which they started on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, and it was well received. They had over 300 people. Um, it's Freeport, Pownell, if that's how you say it, and Dur Durham, Dunham. I'm not, I don't, I don't go up north that much. <laughs> Um, um, but it was really well received and I, I myself did the 21 day challenge with them and I learned a lot, even I did. Um, and I'm encouraged to bring that um, here to Cape and get um, approval from the town council to do that so we can get the community involved and it would just be every day just either reading something, um, a pod, um, uh, educational piece, could be a poem, just learning about um, racism, about races, race, um, race relations, um, you know, many of the things that we've, we've talked about with our definitions and educating people that just don't even know too much. And I'm okay with saying not even I know everything, none of us do. So it's just a good way to get the community involved and um, I'm excited. So yeah, I really would love um, approval so we can get that going because I do have the DEI school task force um, that I'm a member on of, and they would like to participate in that as well. So it would be great to have the town involved, the library course is already involved because we have Rachel Davis, um, and then having the school do it all at the same time and preferably before school gets out would be great. Thanks for that extra detail. Penny, did you have a question or something you want to add? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, on that item, is that, uh, clarify for me, Matt or Rachel, uh, is that is that something that we need, uh, we need to vote on or approve to, to do that? Or is that just programming that, um, Rachel would take the lead on coordinating with members of the committee. What's... I think that would be fine. I just uh, wanted to make sure that uh, the council was comfortable with that uh, as well, and I didn't as a uh, just didn't want to. I guess it's easier to do things and ask for forgiveness, but oftentimes just to uh, to go forward. And uh, uh, I know Melly and I had talked about that, and I didn't know if it was yeah. dependent upon like the month of April or or, or May. So, uh, but I think if if, if there's no council uh, expressed. Uh, I guess uh, uh, non-approval uh, or disagreement with it, then I think you, you'd be good to go. Okay, well, I, I'm seeing heads nodding. I certainly <laughs> support it. Um, so uh, to the degree that you need endorsement, uh, it sounds like you've got it. And um, I, I, I don't think there's a specific, um, you know, motion or action that, that we need to take beyond that. But that sounds um, uh, like something that'll be excellent. And I'll look forward to seeing and participating in that too. So, um, so can any other say, Can I yeah, just say ahead. one more thing? And, yeah. you know, sister city, of course, I mean, that's not a time frame um, thing, but we would love to do that too. I just think it's a great way uh, to um, kind of adopt and foster with another community so we can all learn and what's working and what's not working. So I, again, I just didn't know if we needed approval or if that fall, fell, fell in the category of number two with our original purpose in charge, but I just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, so on that, I mean, I think it, it depends on sort of what level of, obviously, you know, um, we have an existing sister city relationship with a community in, in Russia. Um, there's lots of towns that have multiple sister city relationships. So I would certainly support that. I think it, it falls to the level of what degree of formality um, we're looking to sort of cement this as so if it's something that is uh you know a resolution or a proclamation of some kind then that probably is something that we need to draft up language on and figure out who that's going to be and all that kind of stuff. if it's more of an informal thing then then you know you know I'd, I'd say it's probably a little looser so um maybe just some further discussion on that as to to what what's you know what's in mind and, and how to move that forward great thank you yeah um so 
with the motion on the table to advance this to the ordinance committee for formalizing uh, language around a charge and committee structure and all that kind of stuff. Is there any other discussion on that? Seeing none, I'll just conclude by again, thanking um, you both and Rachel, uh, all of the committee members, um, members of the public that have been part of your process and uh, provided input. Um, I'm really grateful for the work that you all have done uh, on this um, broad, but very important topic. Um, and I'm glad that we as a community are focusing more on it. Um, and so thank you for all of that effort. Um, it's invaluable. So um, Deb, could you uh, read the roll call for the vote, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Can I can I say one more oh. thing, Jamie? I just Go want ahead. to I just want to let um, uh, Melanie and company know that the ordinance committee is quite uh, um, inclusive, and so when we're working on um, uh, what uh, the charge, etc., of the committee, then um, we will invite you to attend it's not done in a vacuum so cool thank you great all right thank you very much everybody for that um we will now move on to uh let's see where's my address there we go item number 42-2021 uh, also tabled from the March 8th uh, meeting, uh, picking up where we left off on short-term rental amendments. Um, is there anybody from the public of which we are at about 24 folks right now that wants to speak on this item at this point? I don't see any hands going up. Mr. Chair, do we need a motion to take it off the table first? Uh, yes, which I don't think we actually did for the last one. So moved. Um, I think it actually being on the, we covered this before, right? We, you need to vote on tabling something, but it being on the agenda effectively takes it off the table. That's Removes what it is. It, yeah. Yeah, so never mind. We don't need to vote on it. Um, so it being on the agenda, it is off the table. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on it? I see no hands. Oh, now I see one hand. Uh, Scott, Matt will open your mic in a second. Hold on. Uh, if you could give name and address and limit your comments to about three minutes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Scott Rockwell, 119 Old Ocean House Road. Um, it's been a long process and I appreciate all the effort that all your folks have uh, put into this. I just had one question that under the final uh, revision of this uh, new, uh, of the ordinance, and it's under in particular the rental intensity clause. I was hoping you folks could address this. Uh, as to what the intent of that category is. Um, and in our particular case, we are considered uh, uh, a hosted, uh, a homeowner hosted uh, stay uh, category. But it would appear that with the current revisions, which would indeed allow uh, two different guest uh, rentals during that seven day period, the, the way it's written, and it appears that, for example, if we had two different guest uh, rentals during that time frame, one for two days, another one for two days, that would allow three days rental. And the way that particular clause addresses the use of our property by family members, um, I'm not sure if the intended um, uh, purpose of this particular restriction would uh, actually disallow our children to come home and stay for that extra three-day weekend 
Um, oftentimes in the past, we have actually, you know, planned around the fact that the kids were coming home for a long weekend, and then we were able to make the other days available. So I, I was just hoping you'd be able to discuss this a little bit further so that we would all be understanding if our homes would not be allowed, um, we would not be allowed to have our children stay in our house during that time frame when it's not available for rentals. I'll put it back in your, your plate. Thank you. Thanks, Scott, for the question. I'll make sure we address it. Um, are there other members of the public that, um, that have any comments at this point? Uh, again, I don't see any hands going up, so speak now or not. Okay. Um, I'm going to hazard a guess that uh, I don't think that the intent of that language is to preclude you from having your own family members come to a uh, residence where you are there um, and uh, you're just having your family members. I think I think the the intent or purpose of that language was around the unhosted properties where we've, you know, had, um, you know, lots of uh, instances of saying, oh, oops, sorry about that. Um, this is, you know, so-and-so cousin Joe that's staying here or, or you know, my brother-in-law or whatever, doesn't count as a rental, things like that. Um, I don't think the intent of that was um, uh, around family members at a, at a hosted, uh, a, a property that happens to be a hosted, um, permitted um, short-term rental. Does anybody else have a different view on that or? No, okay. Um, and so I guess the question is, does the language here, is, it, is the language here clear enough to articulate that or do we need to clean that up a little bit? Is Maureen out there? Yes, she is. I can Looks like she is. Now. I think she was trying to avoid that, but he roped her in, Penny. I'm blaming you. I did. I did. I did. She should be joining us here in any moment. I think you're right, Jamie, that it was about the unhosted piece, but um, we often did talk about the fact that once you're a, a, a short-term rental, that um, your, your, uh, your, your family coming to use the house, which uh, you're not at, um, counted as an event, which we had no way of like sorting that through. Right, but I think the key point is what you just said about when you're not at, right? So yeah. if it's somebody's own family coming to visit them while they're there, I don't think that we can. <laughs> Your family can't come and see you. Your mother and I can come people, to visit. Yeah, I was just <laughs> going to say, there may be some people who would love to have that rule. <laughs> but I don't think that was the intent. We'll, ha we'll have Maureen here in a moment. I'm just waiting for, uh, for some reason. Okay. Uh, we, we dropped her for a moment. So when I see her pop up, I will get her back in. I apologize for the delay. Okay. okay. Um, while we're waiting for Maureen to rejoin, I'll, I'll just ask one last time if there's any other um, public comment. And then I'll close for public comment. All right, I don't see anybody. So we'll wait for Maureen to come back. Um, when we met on this in March, um, folks had some concerns, folks had some things that they wanted addressed. Um, we've got version in front of us that aside from the question that we were just discussing, um, uh, I think response to most of the things that folks um, brought up last time. So uh, does anybody wanna begin? I think it covered most everything that um, I had uh, uh, looked to have changed 
and um, I um, spoke briefly with uh, Maureen earlier today about the on um, page six of the red lined one that uh, primary residents hosted because there was no explicit statement uh, uh, saying that it was uh, there was no limit on it so it's kind of uh, consumed or implied in there which is fine um, I think that um, uh, dwelling unit being brought in to here makes sense um, um, so that um, the primary resident posted if they have uh, underneath one roof two dwelling units then uh, that um, one that's used for a, um, a short-term rental is really falls under adjacent properties. So I think there's some nuances in there that uh, 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 the primary resident posted that we all uh, need to make sure that we understand. I, I support it, I support that change, um, but I just wanted to highlight that for people that the term dwelling unit is an, an important change within that statement. Thank you, Maureen. So I'm and here, now, can you hear me? Yep, got you loud and clear, you. thank you very much. Did you, you still hear want to the, hear me? <laughs> did you hear the discussion that we were having around personal use? I did. Primary hosted versus unhosted. I, I did, and I do understand that it is uncomfortable to tell people that they are limited in hosting family members in their own home, but uh, the exception for allowing people to host family members at the same time that they're running a short-term rental is one of the biggest loopholes in the current ordinance. It was abused um, in a neighborhood that you are all familiar with, actually multiple neighborhoods that you're all familiar with. And so the ordinance is written in such a way that a someone who wants to run a short-term rental really has to make a choice. Do you wanna run a short-term rental or do you wanna have your family members over? And if you wanna run a short-term rental, you have to operate the rest of your home consistent with running a short-term rental. So if you have a short-term rental permit, and you're say, for example, limited to 42 days of rentals and you wanna host your family for one week, that's gotta be one of the weeks. Uh, if you're going to be a short-term rental hosted and you're allowed two rentals per week, you should be saving one of those rentals for when you're having your family members there. And if the council wants to exempt family visits from um, the caps that are imposed by the short-term rental operation, you are basically preserving one of our most problematic loopholes. So I think all we were talking about was the, um, as it pertained to the hosted and not the unhosted. I think there's a recognition that that's um, a loophole that's been widely abused on the unhosted. Is, is that is well, that the also thing is, the case on hosted? The problem is that the ordinance is written so the rules are the same across all four categories. And if you're going to start building in exemptions for one category, I, I shudder to say that we gotta go back and keep working on this. Um, yeah, that's, thank you, I see that Penny. Uh, um, and the, the problem now is that we don't have any of those categories. so. We, you can't compare what, what our problems have been with now with going forward under this, this new um, structure with primary residents. So we've, we've definitely had this issue with people saying that it wasn't an extra rental, it was family members, it was friends, it was friends of family members. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question, Jamie. It, I... it does, but I, go, go ahead, Penny. Um, the fact that the hosted, um, uh, primary residents hosted has no limit on, on the number of days. 
um, that they can do short-term rentals. The intensity is what overlays a guideline or rule on that, which is you can have two within a seven-day period. So what this is saying is that if your um, kids come home for uh, the weekend during a seven-day period, that equals one event, correct? Correct. And that's, in, that's, that's a little bit more enforceable than to say mm -hmm. you get two rentals plus family members. And remember, you know, it was the council who said you wanted something that was more enforceable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. We did. Yes, we did. Council Boucher. We knew oh, go ahead, Penny. I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, we knew that, we knew that, that, um, the, the family, piece was going to be a challenge when we came down to the wires because people would pay attention to it at that point in time so go ahead yeah i just Nicole. wanted to say that at last month's meeting we had decided to move to this two per seven day period for hosteds because they were such a unique position so you know the family visiting in your home that you live in uh, while you're there you you have more opportunities now and as Councillor Jordan mentioned, you now have unlimited with uh, the 42 days doesn't apply and you have two rentals per seven day period. So just, I guess, have your teenagers and your college students let you know ahead of time that they're coming home. Uh, other comments? Go ahead, Councilor Devereux. Um, yeah, I have a hard time with this one. Um, we really haven't had any problems with our, our hosted uh, short-term rentals. And um, I thought making it two per week was um, really restrictive. So I have a really hard time with this. And I understand the loophole and that was on non, that was our non-primary resident um, rent people that were renting that didn't live there primarily and we've changed that to where your primary owner um, on the unhosted so I would be open to, open to changing this to um, uh, unhosted only but I mean hosted only but leaving the unhosted the way it is uh, it just seems so restrictive to me Uh, I tend to agree. I, I, I'm not really comfortable with um, in somebody's hosted property telling them that their family members can't be there. Um, so that wasn't my intent um, with this. I, I certainly appreciate the, the problems that have happened with unhosted properties um, where somebody says, oh yeah, it's a family member that's not really a renter, all that kind of stuff. But I don't really think that that is a problem that exists on the hosted side. And uh, just as a matter of, um, you know, I, 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 I just, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not comfortable with that and it wasn't my intent. So um, Councilor Noonan. Thank you. Um, can I just clarify, um, if you're an unhosted rental, but then you have guests when you are home. Does that count toward that? To me, that shouldn't count towards your 40 day, 42 day limit. Is that, but is the way it's written, does it count? It uh, I see Caitlin nodding and okay. I, I guess I never really put two and two together to figure that piece out because it does feel a little, I know we're talking specifically about hosted right now, but the same thing is true of the unhosted. So if you get an unhosted permit and then you're home and you have family over for the weekend, does that count just toward your 42 days? Uh, if I could. Yeah. A short-term rental may be operated by a property owner in their primary residence when the property owner is not in residence during the tenancy of the short-term rental tenants. A property may be used as a short-term rental for no more than 42 days per calendar year. So if you're there and it is it's your family, not. I 
think you're fine. Right, because then it's not you're not run. It's not a short term rental. At right, that point. but, you're but there. The other, and the other thing is, I, I mean, again, you know, our biggest struggle has been with enforcement, and the primary residence unhosted is limited to forty two days, and each mm -hmm. rental is a minimum of seven days. So you've got this six week window that the code officer has to enforce. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's, I think that's gonna be a little more doable for him, mm -hmm. but the primary residence hosted, I mean, I understand that uh, respectfully, I understand that many people have asserted that there's no problems with the primary residence hosted, but the reality is, is they don't get a permit. So we don't have a good record of whether or not there are really problems. Mm -hmm. um, other other comments. I I want to go back to yeah. I want to go back to um, the the fact that um, when one makes the decision to do short term rentals, they are entering into a a business. And they're making that choice. And I, I think Nicole made a valid, a valid point. Um, the key is, is that people are making choices to have short-term rentals, they, whether they be hosted or non-hosted. When you make that decision, you're having to make certain concessions about your, your property. Um, and I think where I'm at at this point in time is we've made a lot of uh, compromise decisions throughout this, this whole process, this whole process. And, and we, we talked about family members um, back when you were on the uh, ordinance committee, Jamie, um, and People didn't catch on to it at that point in time. It traveled through this document. Um, and um, I have to say that um, I, I think I have to stay with the way the wording exists right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember those discussions. I, I think I, you know, and, and maybe my own fault on this, I, I was much more focused on them as they related to the known problem of yeah. unhosted yeah. properties where people were just claiming friends and family, um, non-commercial use when that wasn't in fact the case. Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't sort of played it forward to um, the application to the hosted properties. I agree with what Maureen's saying. You know, we, we don't have a good baseline to work off of since those have been effectively unregulated to this point to begin with. But throughout this entire year and a half long process, when many people have had the opportunity to voice any concerns that um, exist with those type of properties, we've not heard one hardly peep on that. So um, I, I have to believe that you know, there's there's not um, the problem to the same extent that we were looking to address on the unhosted there. Um, and I, I think it's, I, I just have a very difficult time. I, I, I totally agree with what you say, because I'm, I'm fully on board with the, the notion that if this is a, an enterprise that you want to engage in, then there's certain rules that need to be adhered to. And mm -hmm. if this is what you're signing up for, um, you know, sort of come in with your eyes wide open to that. Um, I, I, this might just be a, a, this particular thing might be a bridge too far for me on that. I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm certainly not, if, if, you know, if the majority of everybody else is fine with this as is, I'm not going to, you know, vote the whole rest of the thing down because of this, but I, 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 it, I, I just didn't think that that was our intent and it's certainly not what mine was. So um, other comments? Councilor Noonan. Sorry, I'll just, uh, 
as we're talking through this and struggling with it a little bit, but I think that the conclusion I'm coming to, Jamie, um, is that I'm, I'm with you on that one. I, I understand that there need to be rules and regulations around this. I also understand that with some of the types of rentals, there were issues with turnover. So you could argue that, you know, even with a hosted rental, you know, if you have a party that's there for a couple of days and then another party that's there for a couple of days and then you have friends that come over, but um, that again, I, I don't think so far we've seen any of those um, concerns be raised and that it does feel a little um, overly restrictive to me. I, I you know, some, I, I, I appreciated what um, Councilor Boucher had to say, but at the same time, I know you can't always plan when, you're, when your 20 year old's gonna wanna come home for the weekend or something. And I would never wanna put someone in the position where they had to say, sorry, you can't come home because we already had two um, sets of guests. And, and I understand what Councilor Penny Jordan's saying that that's kind of what you sign up for, but I just, I don't think it's necessary. I just, I think we'd be instituting it just for the sake of having regulations around it, I guess. So I think well, how, would we, you are. How, mm -hmm. how would we, how would we change the wording? Because I think we've got to get, we have to move this forward tonight. I yep. I agree. No, I so fully somebody, agree with that. I don't, this is the only place that that applies though, correct? Hey. There's no other, there's no other passage where that language applies, is that correct? Did we lose Maureen? Yes, right. you lost me. The reference to family use on rental intensity is the only place that applies, correct? No, it's not. It, the thing is you've written, you know, you've got a whole bunch of requirements here under the short-term rental requirements. And those are, those are a set of requirements that apply to all short-term rentals. So um, everybody's gonna get a permit, advertising. Um, it's the rental intensity paragraph on page eight, starting on line 12. Right. Um, That's the only place though, isn't it? Um, no, I also have to deal with paragraph two up above, I think under advertising. This is the problem. I mean, we, we'd have to go through it again. Can I, can I, I get that? So. Go ahead. I, um, okay. I'm just going to play out a scenario. So, um, kids come home, um, uh, for the weekend, or and I'm not saying any of you hosted people would do this, I'm just saying this could happen. Um, a primary resident hosted, and the uh, people aren't there when there are um, others in their home or dwelling, um, and they say, that was our children when it could have been, or it was my cousins, when it could have been uh, a, um, a short-term rental customer. I mean, that could occur, that the host isn't there and they say, uh, no, that was a member of my family. Councilor Jordan, that's mm -hmm. under paragraph eight on page 12. Um, you could have someone complain that the good neighbor conduct provisions have been violated and the response could be, it wasn't my renters, it was my kids. Right. So that's, the, that's what we were trying to cover, those types of scenarios. And I know what you're saying, Jamie, that it was the um, unhosted that we were really focusing on, but you can flip this around and say, and all the, all the people we talked to that were hosted uh, short-term rentals are really good people. Um, but um, some new hosted types come in and they may play it in a, in a different way. But wouldn't that person still be in violation of the ordinance because they've gotten a hosted permit, but now they're having an unhosted rental? They I mean, would be I, I don't... too. So it would be that too. 
two things. I'm not seeing, I'm, I'm just scanning through the language here though. I'm not, I'm not seeing other passages that make reference to this. Am I missing something? Because even I, two I, above doesn't specifically call out uh, the, the family situation at all. No, because the family situation, I mean, a lot of this stuff is, is blanket applied to all the four categories and it's in different parts of the ordinance. I'm, then, I'm concerned that uh, in, on the fly, I'm going to miss something. Jamie? Go ahead, Councilor Deborah. I've, I've looked through the entire ordinance also, and I only see it there in number three, rental intensity. Um, I think that it's if that's our intention to change this to, um, because it's too restrictive, to um, exempt the hosted. I think we can say that and um, we can approve this and say that we're exempting hosted from this restriction. And if Maureen finds it somewhere else, she can clean it up. But basically we're putting it on the record that it's exempted from hosted only. And um, we can go ahead and vote on this. Uh, Penny? Um, my uh, my question is, how often are we talking about that one would have their family members um, come um, and when they're uh, hosting um, short-term rental death? And um, can we move forward with it as is? and uh, review later. I think there's, there's several places in this ordinance that um, we have made certain assumptions and we, and we say, let's move this forward and we will evaluate it. If we make the commitment to evaluate um, after um, uh, a season, or six months, eight months, to see if the ordinance achieved what we wanted it to achieve. Um, and that at that time we say, okay, um, let's review. And people come forward and they, we can talk about what, uh, uh, if any changes need to occur. That would be my point. I agree with that. One of the things I'd like to see more regularly, especially when we have the permitting in place, is a here's how many unhosted we have, here's how many hosted we have, here's how many complaints we got this month. Like I would love to see that from um, our town manager report at the beginning of our meetings. You know, here's a status update on short term rentals, at least for the next few months. So we can see if it's working and when everyone is permitted, we can send out a survey saying, hey, um, hosts, how's it going? Um, and hopefully to neighbors as well. But I, I think we need data to see if these changes are working. And we also need to see if they're working for our code enforcement officer. Matt, can you, um, I, I have a question for Mr. Rockwell. If I, I saw that he's still in the attendees. Can you open up? His mic again? Yes, sir. Or does he need to, or I don't know if he needs to raise his hand for you to do that or not. But. You should be live right now, uh, Scott. Hey, Scott. Yes, I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jamie. I'm, I'm just trying to think this through, and I, I know we're really like getting wrapped around the axle. We all want to move this forward, but can you can you walk back for me the, the practical impediment that you're trying to lay out here? Like, so like if, if your family comes home, for part or all of a week or something, are you generally renting to short-term renters at the same time or? Oftentimes. Like what, what's, what's the obstacle here that this creates for you? So kids, as you can imagine, are very spontaneous. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess I am as well. Uh, but what happens is 
his kids are saying, hey, mom, dad, I'd like to come home next weekend. Um, and I'll say, oh, wait, I already have four days booked with two different guests. You're going to have to wait until Christmas time. So sorry. That's a little bit of sarcasm in there, but that's the type of conversation that we would end up having. Or I suppose they could sleep in the laundry room. That is a possibility. Um, well, that's but, sort of irrespective but that's of not, the ordinance, though, right? That's just whether or not you've booked your rooms or not. That, right, that really doesn't have anything to do. When our Go kids ahead. come back to visit, we would shut it down during that period of time so we wouldn't have a rental. Uh, because we wouldn't be here the whole time. They would be coming back and we'd be doing things with the kids. So we wouldn't be here to be on hand to tend to any problems that may occur. And actually, uh, the, the, the primary problem that I had was that entire rental intensity clause. If you read it, technically, uh, Lisa and Scott Rockwell can't even go into their own apartment to work in there because it says the owner and family, in fact, I'll read it. <clears throat> the exclusion uh, is including but not limited to personal or family use by the property owner. That, and that goes for both primary, primary as well as the uh, uh, primary hosted as well as unhosted. For instance, I could not have had Thanksgiving dinner in our kitchen that week hosting my family in there because I would have already had guests in the previous uh, week, say two guests. That, that's a possibility. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's just the, the way it's written. It's punitive. It's unnecessary. And, and there's no reason you can't actually just strike that uh, as an exclusion for primary residents hosted because there are other items right in that particular uh, clause that are already uh, uh, isolated for primary residents hosted versus unhosted. I don't want to throw unhosted under the bus, but they've yet to raise their hand and, and uh, talk about this issue at this point in time. Um, so it, it would happen many times spontaneously or even planned because we would say, you know, we have an opportunity here in a couple of weeks is a three day weekend or four day uh, opportunity there uh, to be able to have the kids come up and stay. So it's just, I don't know. I, so I, many I, other I'm not trying to be dense about it, Scott. I'm, I'm still, no, you're not. I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that that's, isn't that a problem that you've booked out your rooms, not knowing that your kids might come home that's just an inventory problem for you, not a, not a problem that's with a, the ordinance, right? That's a parental issue, I suppose. Right? Allowing them, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to get and at. And frankly, having the opportunity that the kids can come back. Uh, I mean, one lives 3,000 miles away. And the, well, actually, they're all in excess of 3,000 miles away. So, um, And when they can get a weekend, we'll gladly fly them home to stay with us. Um, but the point being everything else about the ordinance requires us all to be under our roof. We're sharing our rooms in our house as part of our business, as a way to stay here in our homes, to hopefully have the kids be able to come back and take the homes uh, eventually uh, when they finally settle down. Uh, that said, the exclusion here just seems like it's a, you know, twist in that, the screw a little bit tight uh, on our, you know, for us uh, after all the work we've done. And uh, a possibility of reviewing it in six months, you know, that's, that's a good thing and I appreciate that. And that's um, a worthy endeavor. But I just think it's simply something that can be stricken right there because, uh, and I've read it, read through it. It doesn't refer to this particular exclusion anywhere else except in that particular paragraph. And I think several of the council is there have uh, acknowledged that as well. Okay, thanks, Scott. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm just um, I absolutely don't want to let this be what holds us up on this uh, any longer. We we have to move forward on this tonight. Um, but 
Um, that doesn't make sense to me. So. So do you want me to make a motion? Uh, anybody can, sure. Do I have to read the whole thing? Um, last time I was able to refer to what was written in the, um, uh, in the agenda. Um, so I've got the motion in front of me that was um, presented at the last meeting and it's whereas the town council has received complaints that short-term rental operations in residential neighborhoods have disrupted the peaceful, quiet enjoyment that people as residents expect. Um, whereas the bulk of the short-term rental complaints have originated on properties which are not the primary residence of the property owner. Whereas the town council has determined that the existing regulations on short-term rentals has not adequately addressed the threat to the public welfare relating to compatibility with the residential uses and preservation of the character of the neighborhoods in which they are located and to the availability of the housing stock in town. Whereas the town council has determined that short-term rentals uh, operated by someone in their primary residence will be more diligent in managing the short-term rental and preserving the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of their neighborhoods. Whereas the town has adopted zoning in the town center and business aid districts that require commercial uses on the first floor, which promote um, commercial vitality. I have a question on that one. Uh, vitality, a pedestrian friendly environment and short term rental operations on the first floor is incompatible with these commercial district purposes. Whereas the town council intends to improve enforcement by requiring that all short term rentals obtain a permit by reinforcing town regulations by adding third party enforcement services. Whereas the town council wants to preserve some opportunities for property owners to earn short-term rental income and defray taxes and housing costs. Whereas the town council seeks to balance the competing interests of property owners wishing to rent their residential properties to short-term rental guests for compensation against the interests of residents wishing to preserve the traditional peace and quiet of their residential neighborhoods and to ensure the safety of occupants occupant of short-term rentals, whereas the town council has adopted a moratorium on issuance of new short-term rental permits, which will expire June 30th, 2021, whereas the town has engaged in a thorough and transparent public process with expansive opportunities for written comment and oral testimony that included Town Council workshop on September 4, 2019, eight ordinance committee meetings, four planning board workshops, a planning board hearing open to the public on November 17, 2020, four town council workshops and four town council meetings, including a public hearing. Now and therefore the town council adopt short-term rental amendments. What, Matt? Go ahead, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Council Jordan. There, there are also, I, I believe, uh, four different four amendments that are also as a part of this uh, that uh, come uh, that were uh, crafted at the last at the end of the last meeting uh, on this subject as well. That you may want to say, uh, including uh, amend including all four amendments. Is that written in some motion that should have been in front of me? Um, no, uh, uh, my, my trustee scorekeeper and uh, assistant town manager pointed that out to me that uh, uh, that that was approved uh, or was part of the motion at the last last one. But you needed to have the the verbiage actually spelled out so you could see it uh, in its, in all its clarity. So whereas the council uh, requested for amendments that were um, subsequently incorporated within this ordinance. Is that what you're saying? 
Yes, ma'am. I would. I, I appreciate that. And so, <laughs> just trying to keep the scorecard clean. <laughs> so, are you going to uh, fix that uh, motion that will go into our minute? Okay. So now, therefore, the town council adopts the short-term rental amendment. That's my motion. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Is there a second, Councillor Gabrielson? Further discussion? Um, I, um, I would like to make a motion that we revise uh, on page eight, line, uh, Sixteen to insert uh, after property owner and before comma for unhost uh, for unhosted properties. I'll second that. So we have a motion and a second for an amendment to section three on page eight. Is there discussion on that? Just repeat that one time, Jamie. Sorry, I want to make yep. sure. Yeah, so I, I think I think simply by adding in reference to uh, unhosted primary residence there. Um, so the sentence would read: When a rental or not compensated use of the property by any one individual or group, including but not limited to personal or family use by the property owner of an unhosted oh, yeah. primary yeah. residence that that covers what we've just been debating back and forth. Okay, but do we, do you think we then need to uh, just totally scrap the end of that sentence where it says, except that a primary residence hosted may be allowed no more than two? Wow. Nope. Well, because now we're saying that they are a lot. We wouldn't want to reference hosted in that sentence if we don't want it to apply to them, right? When I, um, We've created a loophole. I don't think so. I think so. I don't think so. It it looks like there's still a um, two uses allowed. However, they can have um, family in the home, and it doesn't count as a use. It's so still. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, it still says they can only have two at the beginning, but then under the section about non-compensated use, we no longer want to say they can only have two because what we're saying is that only applies to unhosted. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right? So we say upfront primary yes. hosted can have two, and then we're saying, but any non-compensated use by an, in an unhosted rental counts. Yes, yes, so I see what you're saying. So I would suggest yep. that we, we would wanna just delete the whole end of that sentence, the except that a primary residence hosted. Yes. I agree with what you're saying, and I would accept that as a friendly amendment to strike okay. uh, everything from uh, that second highlighted portion on. Yes. Yep. Would be my amendment to your yep. amended. So, uh, Councilor Penny Jordan? I, the reason I say we've created a loophole is because now a, a hosted short term rental can say, but that was my cousin Fred. I didn't use up my two. I didn't use up my two because my cousin Fred came and visited. So I I can still um, I can I can still rent again this week, even though it really wasn't their cousin Fred. 
I see what you're saying, Penny. However, we do have penalties in place. And if um, every week they're saying it's um, cousin Fred, then we're going to figure out it wasn't and they're going to lose their license. I, mm -hmm. I think that we have um, penalties and what Nicole said is, let's see how it goes. And then in six months, if there are problems, we, we can make it more restrictive. But, but going out of the chute so restrictive just seems to me um, uh, punitive, really. Um, and let's see how it goes by leaving the, um, the hosted exempt from relatives. Yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'll, I'll lay out the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lay out a real life, you know, more of a real life scenario, right? So, you know, say the Rockwells have a guest Monday, Tuesday night, and that's one rental and that person leaves on Wednesday, and they have another guest come in Wednesday, Thursday, and those people leave, and then their children and grandchildren come in for the weekend. I, I don't, I, I like, I, I don't think that that um, you know, the, the, the children and grandchildren come home to visit for the weekend or something. I don't see how that is a problem mm -hmm. and, and something that the town should be regulating like that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 on a practical level, find it unlikely that there's going to be renting and family there at the same time. I don't know if that's a concern that people have just on the you know, um, amount of available inventory of rooms. So, uh, I don't, I don't know. Can somebody reread? Can somebody reread what we are going to be? Um, so, my proposed going? amendment is starting on line fourteen, section three, page eight. When a rental or non-compensated use of the property by any one individual or group, including but not limited to personal or family use by the property owner of a primary unhosted, uh, primary residence unhosted short-term rental, so on and so forth. And then striking the accept part, the second reference to the accept part in that paragraph. Is there other discussion on the proposed amendment? Seeing none, let's vote on the amendment then. Deb, can you call the roll for the vote on the amendment? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? No. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? No. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries five yay, two nay. Okay, so with the approved amendment, are there any other amendments uh, beyond what we've already approved tonight and previously that anybody intends to offer? Is there any other discussion on the motion with the amendments overall then? Maureen, okay. there's, there's no ripple effect through the rest of this. That, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to make a, this has been a long, long process, and I just want to make a few quick closing comments on this. Number one is I want to really, uh, as I have on a number of different occasions, thank um, Penny, uh, you for your um, spearheading the work of the Ordinance Committee on this um, over several iterations of the Ordinance Committee. Um, thank you very much for that, for the process that you um, uh, architected in terms of um, uh, working to gather stakeholder input uh, on this in a way that I, I don't think I've seen done on, on hardly anything else in my tenure on the council. So 
Thank you very much for all of your work, uh, for all the folks that um, served on the ordinance committee in working on this for your time and efforts. And then to all of the other counselors, um, you know, for all of the time that we've all put in on this. Um, I wanna very much thank the members of the public um, across uh, the full spectrum of, of uh, opinions that were offered. Um, I think as has been stated here a number of different times, what um, we're vote, about to vote on here tonight um, is intended to be a compromise um, that tries to, to the best degree possible, reflect um, you know, all different stakeholders and their positions on this in a way that um, tries to balance all of the different interests that were brought before us um, and, and really try and do as little harm to all of those folks as is possible in the crafting of the ordinance. Um, the thing I just wanna you know, sort of reiterate um, that I think is the key nut takeaway, even though in the last two meetings, we've gotten really wrapped around some very fine point details on this, the key items on, this, um, on these regulations are, are really borne out in the fact that number one, everybody is now gonna to need to register, okay? So everybody conducting this type of activity and enterprise is going to have to register. And if they're not, there's consequences for that. By factor of them registering, we'll have a much better view of what activity is taking place in town and be able to better craft and, and respond to those conditions going forward in the future. As Council Boucher indicated tonight, this should not stop here. This should be an ongoing process that accounts for the activity that's going on and how that activity is measuring up against the regulations that we're about to vote on tonight. Number three, for the vast majority of folks, um, uh, the, the, it'll have to be your primary residence uh, that you are um, using for short-term rentals. And I know that we've heard um, very um, you know, compelling um, appeals from residents about some of the really trying uh, behaviors that they've had to endure and put up with um, uh, under the existing regulations. And my fervent hope and true belief is that the change to primary residence is going to dramatically, dramatically reduce the occurrences of those um, instances. And in some of the cases and some of the neighborhoods um, that the problem has been the biggest, um, I think, you know, specifically in the Richmond Terrace neighborhood, all but one of those properties would qualify under these new regulations uh, should we move forward with them in a minute. So um, that is a really, really big takeaway. Um, we'll have a much better way of, um, you know, uh, uh, having, you know, a second set of eyes out to what activity is taking place with the data analytics firm that we've signed on with. So that will greatly help with the enforcement and we've strengthened um, the, the ramifications should anybody um, uh, violate any of these regulations. All of those things are the most important components of this. The things about length of stay, days, et cetera, the things that, that we've just been discussing for the last you know, 20 minutes to a half hour, I don't wanna minimize those. I don't wanna diminish their importance because those fine details are important in terms of how something gets carried out. But the major, major impact of these will be in the other things that I just enumerated. So um, I wanna thank everybody for getting us to this point. I think we've made um, tremendous um, advancement on this and I'm hopeful, uh, really, really hopeful um, that it will provide the, the relief to those have, who have been negatively impacted while still allowing um, those people who've been following the rules um, to continue to operate in the manner in which they've been doing. So if there's no further comment, um, Penny, you've got your hand raised, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Maureen for all of the iterations of this document that she has uh, taken us through. The, the level of, of detail and thinking and, um, and for putting out the, uh, in front of us some of the tough questions that we really needed to grapple with. And um, I don't think we could have asked for a better person to go into this level of detail with us. So thank you, Maureen. Agree. I know we all echo that. Uh, Councilor Devereaux, did you want to add? I'd just like to um, follow up on um, Jamie's remarks and, um, and of course, um, Penny's remarks with Maureen. Thank you so much for, for all of the work and the late nights you've put in. But I really just want to um, also comment on 
um, everyone who's been a part of this discussion, who's emailed us, who's come to the meetings, whether it was ordinance committee or the town council, um, and have shared their experiences of um, difficult experiences with short-term rentals in their neighborhoods. I know you would prefer that um, there were no um, short-term rentals at all in Cape. And I just wanna say, I really appreciate your willingness to um, be a part of this process and to compromise. And um, I, I know it's been really difficult for you. And likewise, my heart goes out to everyone who's been responsible and acted as good neighbors when renting their properties, um, who can no longer, if this passes, <laughs> will no longer be able to rent short term or have their ability to rent um, decreased a fewer days. Um, I know this has been a compromise as Jamie said, and I too am hopeful that this is gonna be, provide relief to um, everyone who's been negatively impacted and um, create um, that sense of uh, community that we all are hoping it will create. So thank you all for being part of this process. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, let's vote. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. All right. Um, next up is item number 67-2021, opportunity for public comments relating to the proposed FY 2022 municipal budget. Uh, is there um, is there anybody uh, from the public that would wish to speak on this item at this time? Um, I just want to remind folks that we will be having a public hearing on the budget, both the general fund and special revenue funds. That'll be at a special meeting on May 3rd, and then the town council will vote on the um, special revenue funds at the May 3rd and the general fund budget on the 10th. We have upcoming meetings um, jointly with the school board. Uh, we'll also be reviewing their presentation to us of the uh, school budget. Um, so seeing no hands going up right now, um, there's no specific action to take on this and we'll move on to item number 18, which is 68-2021, request for a town council workshop relating to shortcut roads. Uh, council Gabrielson, you were approached by a resident who wanted to initiate conversation on this. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to tee this up and then um, see if there's any members of the public that wish to speak on it. Great, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I, um, I I just I guess um, want to take a, an opportunity to to say uh, you know having been approached by uh, by the board of the Cottage Brook Condominium Association, I uh, wanted to bring this item up for council discussion uh, to see what the ne uh, best next step might be for proceeding um, with a review of this gate. I know this has been an issue of some uh, significant debate in the past, um, having, um, having now had the Cottage Brook uh, neighborhood built out, um, it seems that there's a, to me anyway, there's a, su a substantive change in, uh, in that area of town. And, and I think legitimate reasons for, for neighbors to wanna look at, at exploring new ways to more easily connect with, with neighbors. Um, and so I'd like to, you know, just bring this forward to the council and see what what appropriate next steps might be. Um, and uh, I think the best place to start that's probably going to be in a workshop. We've 
set a couple of things to workshop tonight, but um, <laughs> scheduling an upcoming workshop, workshop discussion. Oh, Mr. Chairman, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I was just asking if there was anybody of the six folks remaining from the public um, that wanted to speak on this item at this point. Don't see any hands. Um, I imagine, first off, that there's probably at least a couple of counselors that maybe don't have the, the history on this um, that would benefit from uh, workshop discussion. Um, uh, so I think that makes sense. I'm guessing that probably our May workshop would be the time to take this up. Um, uh, so if you want, if you want to make a motion, Jeremy, go ahead. Sure, I, I'll uh, move that we refer this to workshop. And I, if it gets scheduled in May, I think that's fine. I don't think there's a particular rush on it, but that time frame sounds great. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. second. Councilor Noonan, any discussion? Go ahead, Penny. You're on mute. If we're gonna if we're gonna send this to workshop, um, the, I think the planning board dealt with this issue in depth as this uh, uh, development was happening. So it it would be helpful if uh, Maureen or somebody sent a long that information or she was available to help us with the history it would be good certainly yeah go ahead matt mr chairman if, if i may uh yeah i just took down a note to pull together a history of the shortcut road uh uh for the may workshop so uh what we can do is uh try to get the information related to the referendum that was uh that that took place back in 2006 as well as uh, any other information related to the cottage uh, Cottage Brook development when that took place uh, uh, as well. So we'll try to pull together as much information as we can as to the background of how it came into place and then uh, what took place during that time period as well. So we'll have that prepared and ready for council. Maybe we could deal with the Broad Cove one at the same time. Let's <laughs> <laughs> <Don't kidding>. <laughs> Any other comment? Okay, uh, Deb, can you call the roll, please? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next is item number 69-2021, recommendation to use unassigned funds to cover an overage in the communications tower project. Matt, can you bring us up to speed on this, please? And then we'll I'd go to public to. comment. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as, you, as you recall, in the current budget, uh, the communications tower was an approved project, and we did go out to uh, bid or ask for request for proposals from the from the general market, uh, soliciting them from all folks who do. It's a fairly, as I said in my memo, a fairly specialized uh, area of construction with only so many folks who do that. But we reached out to everybody available to get uh, to get bids from. Uh, we had what we thought at the time coming into the project, uh, a really strong cost analysis uh, to, to base our, our estimate from. Uh, and the bids came in greater, significantly higher than what we were looking at. Uh, part of that is due to increases, mostly material costs. The steel tariffs uh, has not helped out uh, when you are looking to put up a 180 tower, 180 foot steel, mostly steel tower, uh, as well as electronic components have also uh, increased. Uh, so what we did, and when I say we, it's not the royal we, it's myself, uh, Chief Gleason, Chief N, uh, Jay Reynolds and Steve Harding, the town's attorney, as well as Mark Davis, uh, uh, one of our consultants and, uh, and other, uh, other electrical consultants as well as site work folks, tried to value engineer as much as we could into the project, uh, reduce the scope and size of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the building that will, ho will, will host the electronics, uh, also reduce the size of the fenced in area, uh, 
and try to do other other changes to the project in order to find savings and cut costs where where applicable. We did that over about a two month period of time. Uh, somewhat concerned now that that if we don't keep moving forward, uh, elements of the construction will continue to increase. Uh, our, our antenna equipment, for instance, have gone up almost 10% in just that two month period of time from 50 to 52,000. So I guess that's what, uh, what concerns us. And uh, so what we've done, to close that gap is we have uh, looked at our existing projects and other uh, areas that we can uh, beg, borrow and steal funds from our uh, from our existing budget or current budget, but that has still left us with about a 40, uh, just under a $45,000 gap. That's about 43,000 and change, but we felt just in case of any other uh, unintended changes that may have taken place between last week and, and approval tonight before we sign a document, that we uh, we would just put in an extra 17 to 1800 in contingency, and that's why we were requesting the 45,000 from unassigned funds to, to cover that gap and, and commence with signing the documents and uh, look to have construction take place ASAP. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, real quick, I'll ask if there's anybody from the public that wants to speak on this. I don't see any hands raised. Um, is there a motion? Go ahead. I'll move. Oh. Me? Oh. Yep, go ahead, Penny. Okay, okay I'll go. Um, I move that um, we, 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 um, that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council authorizes the use of $45,000 from the unassigned fund balance for the remaining project cost for the communication tower project for communication equipment of public safety and public work. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, second. by Council Boucher. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, go to the vote. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next is item number 70-2021, proposed agreement with Central Maine Power to convert Municipal street lights to LED. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak about this? Seeing no hands raised. Um, Matt, uh, do you wanna tee this up as well? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in light, of, uh, in light of the council goals that were stated and just recently affirmed, uh, the council is looking to uh, Reduce energy independence, energy dependence, consumption, and greenhouse gas emissions. Pursue LED lamp installation, and uh, as well as reduce our current our, our carbon footprint. I'm happy tonight to bring forward probably the best deal uh, I could will be able to strike in my career, and that is converting uh, all 361 current street lights to LED at a cost of 0, $0.0 dollars to the town, while also saving just under eighteen thousand uh, dollars in year one. Uh, and we do not have to maintain them. And CMP is, is, is very enthusiastic about this. And uh, it's a 15 year agreement that can be ended upon the terms that are were identified in the agreement with notice to, from either, par, either party within the window as identified. So this is a win-win for the town in so many different ways and very happy to bring this forward at uh, again at $0.0, $0 cost to the town. Happy to answer any questions. I have a quick question about what you just referred to, Matt, about the sort of term of the deal and, and all that stuff. So, um, I mean, why? What would what would cause either side to want to get out of the deal? I guess it's it's just a it's just a I guess it's more or less a fail a fail safe clause that they have in the agreement. Uh, perhaps if they if they find that they don't want to be in the light light business anymore, they could end the end the agreement. Or if the town decided that. It could get a better uh, deal by perhaps uh, going with a different provider for energy. Uh, 
if we decided to opt out, we would have to, uh, you know, basically buy out the end, of, you know, the remaining years at the cost of the fixtures uh, that has been, uh, you know, um, aged out and depreciated. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's. I think it'd be unheard of unless unless things dramatically change in the scheme. But I think it's more or less a, a, a security a security measure within the contract. Right, and the savings presumably that would accrue would cover that anyway. So yeah, yeah, but I think the did, savings so. will only increase over time as energy costs uh, uh, increase, as well as but at the same time, uh, significantly as you saw in the in the in my in my memo, uh, reducing the wattage amounts by astronomical amounts. It's it's yep. uncanny. Okay, uh, is there a motion? So moved. Uh, motion by Council Boucher is our second. Second. Second by Council Gabrielson. Any discussion? Seeing none. Deb. Council Boucher. Yes. Council Devereaux. Yes. Council Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Yes. Councilor Noonan. Yes. Chairman Garvin. Yes. Motion carries. Great. Um, next up uh, to close the agenda is any comment from citizens on topics that were not on the agenda. I will also say that um, we do have an executive session scheduled for following this, but um, I don't think we need to have that tonight. I'm not prepared to move forward with it, um, both based on the hour and also um, uh, I need to do more homework to compile all of your responses that you all got to me. Um, and I already discussed that with Matt earlier today. So what we'll probably do is add an executive session to the back half of one of the two budget meetings upcoming um, and handle it that way. I don't expect that executive session to be very long when we do have it, but I just want to be fair to get everybody the information ahead of time. So um, that being said, um, is there anybody remaining from the um, five members of the public that would like to make any comment for something that was not on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilor Caitlin Jordan, seconded by Penny. Uh, assuming no discussion, Deb, could you please read the roll one last time? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the work tonight and see you next time. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.